We'll go ahead and get started. We appreciate uh, appreciate everybody hanging in there. And I'll go ahead and give an introduction uh, to our guests. Um, it would be very easy to stand up and talk about Lowell for about 20 minutes just with an introduction. So I really tried to shorten it, but I don't mean to take anything away from the many, many uh, accomplishments that he's had, but let's uh, let's talk about some of them. Lowell Bears intellectual curiosity during his almost 60 year career has taken him from a practicing attorney to an entrepreneur, a tireless advocate for natural resources and wildlife conservation, and a legal and environmental historian and author. Bear continues contemporaneously to practice law, specializing in wildlife conservation and natural resource policy, legislation and regulation, and writes extensively on these subjects. Lowell grew up in Northern Indiana and attended Valparaiso University and IU School of Law, now Maurer. He's received too many awards to name them all here, and, and honestly, there are dozens of them. Uh, but they include IU's Distinguished Service Award, the Academy of Law Alumni Fellows, and the IU Bicentennial Medal. Lowell, has, Lowell took the lead in drafting President George, President George H. W. Bush's Wildlife Conservation Agenda in 1989 and has been the advisor an advisor and counselor to all successive presidential administrations. He has written extensively in books and journals on the management of public and private lands for wildlife, the intersection of state and federal authorities, and the Endangered Species Act. There's simply too much to go on, but I'll end by mentioning that Lowell was instrumental in the recent establishment of the new Indiana Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, or CRU, a multi-agency partnership with Purdue University, the land-grant university, aiming at improving wildlife, natural resource management, and wildlife management in the state of Indiana. We're very glad to have Lowell join us today. And Thank uh, you. We're at your service. He used to have a professor here, and I, I can't remember his name. It might have been Austin Clifford. But if you came into, into class 30 seconds after, you know, the set hour, He'd throw you out. <laughs> I'll never forget that. We had one fellow that was in a wheelchair and he kept rolling in. Both, both doors, he was on a platform, I forget which classroom it was, and both doors bolted open about 30 seconds after the class started, but he was in his seat. <laughs> and Sipper didn't know what to do. <laughs> My apologies for running late. Um, um, I, uh, I wanted specifically to meet with you all need the blacks because um, wildlife conservation, natural resource management issues have been my life for much of my career. I've been in my career that'll be sixty years next year, and uh, <clears throat> I uh, I really became passionate about wildlife and natural resources early on in the career when I got out of here. I thought I was going to be an antitrust lawyer, uh, but uh, Unfortunately, uh, the world had different plans for me. And uh, at any rate, I ended up in, in, in this arena, uh, fortunately, because I understood the arena, having been raised on a farm and partially on a granddad's ranch out in Montana. And I was a sportsman anyway, uh, with you know hunting and shooting and fishing and that sort of thing. And uh, at any rate, it was just a natural to begin to work in the in the wildlife management field. And it's been primarily a, a bo pro bono approach to it. I think. But the sporting community, uh, which is today recognized by mm, a lot of sports groups like Safari Club International, the Wild Sheep Foundation, the Elk Foundation, all of the, the, the single species groups that are out there, mule deer, quail, pheasants, um, when they started up, they were seed building organizations, and they really didn't have counsel in Washington or understand the Washington gamut that you really got through to work with the agencies and the count uh, White House and the Congress. And uh, so they turned to me because I was a known sportsman, and I was—they all knew who I was, and so they would turn to me for legal advice and representation when they had to go to the hill or deal with one of the agencies like Fish and Wildlife or uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service or the Park Service or um, you know, the agricultural area at the Department of Agriculture. And so that really my entry as a lawyer into the, the, the wildlife field. Uh, and that started in the late 60s, really, when they started to be, be formed. 
and they all have since then grown up. They've got their own major organizations. Most of them have uh, paid counsel uh, and lobbyists in Washington and so forth. And um, I wanted to visit with you about what it's like as a lawyer to be in that world, to be in the, 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 the natural resource arena. Uh, it, and you primarily deal with the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Interior. And that means that interior, that means fish and wildlife and parks, basically, occasionally Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and over in the Forest Service, uh, for Forest Service issues, that's a, a, a subset of the Department of Agriculture. And so you're dealing with ag over there. But then all of the farm, uh, the farm bill programs that have grown up since the farm bill started, like uh, uh, so the conservation reserve. I, I know these all by by uh, an acronym, <laughs> like uh, the, the conservation reserve program or EQIP, and so forth. And they are rich in in um, need of of counsel out there in the field to understand what they are because they are so complicated. Uh, just, I've been uh, on the road with the Endangered Species Act. This is its 50th year. When that was passed in 1973, it was 20 pages long and 50 pages of regs that came out a couple of years later, regulations that were written, will come in and, and uh, make it bond. And today, it's there are 5,000 pages of regulations. and. The, the, the bill uh, through the uh, act of Congress through many amendments, through three basic heavy amendments and then a lot of minor amendments uh, is now 50 pages long. And for the uh, a farmer, the rancher, the layman out in, in America who understand that, they don't understand it. Uh, and even though I'm supposed to be the, the, the expert in it, you know, there are parts of it that are even challenging to me and I have to pull the law out and look at it again or the reg to understand it, and then I remember what the case law goes with that, uh, and so forth. And uh, uh, the farm bill is heavy as well; it's laden with with a lot of a lot of legalese. That, you know, when you're when you're inside the beltway too long, that's all you talk and think about is legalese. And, and and the farm bill is the same way. And it needs trained counselors that understand the natural resource and wildlife. business, but that area, uh, but have an appreciation of what the natural resources challenges are all about. And you only learn that by being out in them, by, by camping out, by going on treks and spending time, uh, you know, outdoors. Um, and uh, um, you learn more with a fishing rod in your hand sometimes um, mm -hmm. than you do by sitting in a classroom or sitting in your office reading, reading the text. You know, like really related to what 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 kind of environment, what what's the habitat look like that this particular bill uh, or law or reg applies to, and um, that really takes a legal background. To do. Uh, um, we are uh, oh not overrun, but, but the field is the, the the professionals in that world are the forest trained foresters, a uh, biologist, uh, uh, game management people. Um, the botanist and so forth, the, the entomologist and the like. And <clears throat> they understand the science about it. But natural resource management is only 10% science and it's 90% people. 10% science and 90% people. Um, I was at, uh, I was speaking uh, years ago when the first cooperative, <clears throat> well, when the cooperative wildlife <clears throat> a units research program got together. They got together, all the scientists in America got together every uh, two years for an all hands on deck meeting for like three days. And that particular meeting was Santa Fe. And I, I was giving a, a speech and I asked uh, the group, there were about 120 uh, scientists there, all PhDs. Uh, the room was just it was long and narrow, which is filled with people all the way to the back. And I asked them, after I got through my remarks, okay, how many of you are trained in human resource issues? 
in the human dimension. Where does the human dimension come into this? And there was silence. And then I, I looked at John Oregon, Dr. Oregon, who was the director then at the time. And um, he said, and then I looked again and I said, all right, how many of you are HR people, human resources people, human dimension? How many specialists? These are out of 120 people, one guy stood up way in the back of the room. And I looked at John and I said, John, can that be right? There's got to be more. And he 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 just did this. <laughs> and uh, they've changed the program, believe me, since then. That was the beginning of the change of the program. Yesterday, we just had uh, initiated the new CRP program that will go to Purdue. People who ask me why Purdue, as a matter of fact, you know, I've got the IU. <laughs> I got a lot of flack yesterday. <laughs> I said, I'm a proud Indiana graduate. But um, at any rate, uh, they've changed the program. And Indiana, for example, when Amanda Wusterfeld, she's the head of Fish and Wildlife with the DNR and D DNR here in Indiana. Um, when when they began talking about okay, what are the selections right here for the professors? They're going to put three PhDs to run the new department up at Purdue. It's, it nested within uh, the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. School of Agriculture. That's where it's nested. And um, uh, she said to me early on, and this was like a year ago, you know, we are short on how we work with the public. We're really short on how we deliver what we as a DNR have, the Dep Department of Natural Resources. We're short on um, our, our outreach. And so sure enough, Three professors that they're going to hire. One of them has got to be, a, you know, has a real good background in human relations and human uh, human interaction and so forth. And, and so again, I'll say science is ten percent management and wildlife and resource issues are ten percent science, but they're ninety percent people. And that's really important for you as lawyers, future lawyers, to get uh, because the very few. That enter the, the biologists don't understand that at all because they're scientists. They're used to looking through their <laughs> microscopes, you know, doing them, collecting data in the field and so forth. And uh, it's uh, it's really relevant to you as lawyers. So you really got to think about that when you approach it because you'll be, especially with a lot of you, one step ahead. Most of the people in that in that world, if you just choose to enter that world. Now, how would you as a lawyer enter that world? This, uh, first of all, so there is. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that this is primarily litigation training. I, we try to do both. Kim uh, Ferraro is our primary litigator, and uh, I am not a litigator. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a problem solver in different ways. What we try to do is expose them to all the tools in the in the legal toolbox to save the world. Mm -hmm. Do you do any uh, human resource uh, discussions at all and interactions with people? Some, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was trained before I became a lawyer. I was a grassroots organizer. I, you're preaching to the choir when it comes to my my experience because that, that job that I had in the Powder River mountains uh, in the in the Bighorn Mountains, the Powder River Basin in northern Wyoming in 1995 after my first year of law school was grassroots organizing and it was the most important legal job. It was a non-legal job, but for my legal career, it was the most important job I ever had because I learned how to talk to ranchers. I learned how to talk to farmers. I learned how to talk to hunters. Really important stuff. Are there, uh, Professor, 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 <laughs> are there any human resource or HR is there any training in that area within the law school that occurs? Not to my knowledge. Okay. No. No. Okay. Well, I would I would just say that within CLC to add what Christian was saying, we do uh, have a focus on the public interest mm -hmm. side of litigation and the work that we do, mm -hmm. including most recently environmental justice and how that intersects. Mm -hmm. 
um, how natural resources, preservation, conservation, protection helps communities that have been so disenfranchised and that to be able to do that work, you have to gain the trust of the communities. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, certainly within my time at CLC, we've been trying to focus uh, that discussion for students so that they understand the critical importance. Well, um, one of the, one, one of the, I was, uh, I, I'm, I'm, because I live and work in Washington, I stay very close to the folks that run the agencies. And I remember Dan uh, Ash was the, the really the last director of the Fish and Wildlife Service under the last administration. Wait a minute, that was Trump, the one before that, uh, Obama. And uh, he, one of his biggest complaints, and this was primarily directed at the West, but although, also, although we got a lot of flack from the South, um, the Southern states, was he was always accused of moving the goalposts. That's what he called them. They always, he said, they always say, I moved the goalposts. When he sets objectives, they try to meet it. And then they supposedly think, you know, we, their excuse is that they can't meet it. it. Well, he moved the goalposts. How could we, <laughs> you know, move with him? Um, that's just one example. But if you, uh, because I've had a real foot in the West, my brother, uh, has, ever since he left uh, Ball State, I think he went to Ball State. Um, uh, and has lived in the West as a rancher ever since. So I've had a lot of connection with the West. And boy, you drive up in a in a, in a shiny forest service truck or fish and wildlife service truck into a, into a barnyard, and you you know you're going to either get this or he's well he's not here today <laughs> right in the house or in the barn or whatever. But you. Somebody just said, you use the word trust. Building trust is, 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 is a hard job. It's a human relationship, but it's a hard job. Uh, there was a guy, a, a biologist, wonderful man, who had a great um, demeanor with, with the public out in, see, what was, I was Wyoming. It was in Matitsi, Wyoming. And he was a graduate of the University of Wyoming. And he was out uh, there. Uh, uh, in that particular area, studying black-footed parrots mm -hmm. and dealing with the reintroduction of black-footed parrots. And all of the, the ranchers that I met with, because I spent about a week there myself, getting to know the ranchers and understanding the habitat of, of the black-footed parrot. And, and we did a release while I was there. And um, um, they all said, uh, Jesse Belay, Blue Blazing, French name, I think. At any rate, they all loved loved him. And the reason they loved him is because he would, would come to sit at their table and have a cup of coffee. He wouldn't even talk about while he was there. I mean, it was four or five visits having coffee with the ranchers before he even got into them. How can I help you? Because the last thing they want to hear is, how the government's here, how can we help you? <laughs> he was uh, with the state of Wyoming, but he worked hand in, in glove with the federal uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, folks that were in, well, they were throughout that area, um, up in Billings and down in, uh, say, Casper, I right think. At any rate, uh, trust, building trust is part of it. You don't learn that here, but it's part of the, of the, of the human dimension. So enough about that what could you do with a law degree in that world if you choose to go to natural resource work or the, the environmental work well law firms uh, are all you, you know i'm sure enough about law firms. They're, mm -hmm. they're a small firm but they're they're real niche firms that work in this area and they're primarily litigation firms they're not um counseling firms as such they're primarily litigation uh, look at either the federal or the state governments and uh, like the u.s fish and wildlife service they've got a lot of lawyers that really work side by side with the, with the biologists in reintroducing uh, or interpreting new the new laws new regs or even how some of the old ones that haven't been used for years everybody's forgotten what was her their history, their background, why were they created? And the legal profession is really a, gives 
um, you an, an advantage over a biologist to understand then how to apply it. Um, so, in addition to either state DNRs or the federal government, either with that agriculture or interior, both of which have lawyers other than in the, the solicitor's office. Um, my, um, there are sporting groups that I mentioned earlier, the single, uh, uh, the, the single species groups, and they have, they all have offices in Washington now, and lawyers are filled, most of those are staffed by, by not by biologists, but by lawyers because they're interfacing every day with the federal government, either in Congress, with um, CEQ over at the White House, or the agencies as well. And uh, uh, many of the, all of the congressional committees are staffed basically by lawyers. And you go, for example, to the House, uh, which I'm more familiar with, which is where I really started as a page book. But the, 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 there, uh, the uh, Natural Resources Committee. Um, all the committees have the majority and then a separate office for the minority. They're split. And um, the better offices always are taken over by the, you know, the incumbent uh, administration. And those committees are all staffed by, by attorneys. I mean, there's not a violation among them. Um, so, and, and most people don't know that, uh, that or, you know, don't have them in out there or work, work with Washington. But when you're dealing with a, with one of the, of the committees or subcommittees, for example, natural resources in the house has like four or five, I'd have to look at the book, but has four or five sub committees and each have their own separate legal staffs as well. And so you kind of, kind of dig deep and burrow into it. How is it, what is the organizational makeup of a particular uh, uh, committee uh, like that? And in, in addition to, to natural resources, um, well, you look, look at the congressional directory. There are all sorts of committees, but that's the one that comes to mind. Over in the Senate, you've got the Energy and Environmental Agency. Uh, I know these. I know these by the <laughs> Uh, but the, there's there are a couple of committees over in the Senate, same way, and they're deep in their in their subcommittees and the work the subcommittees do. Because that's really where the work, work gets done with all the subcommittees, not with the main committees. Uh, although they they carry their own, but they really divvy out their portfolio amongst the subcommittees as as well. And if you get a congressional directory, you, you you'll see all of. Let's see. So you got law firms, you got the sporting groups that have attorneys in their offices, and then you've got the Congress, CEQ, which is a kind of the Council on Environmental Quality over at the White House. And they're tough to crack because yes, they're all lawyers, but uh, they're you know they they pull from uh, the supporters of that particular administration that perhaps have been out fundraising for that candidate that became president. Etc. Um, now I'm sure I left out some, but you've got the Congress CEQ. Oh, and then of course agriculture and interior. Now, when it had interior, for example, the Fish and Wildlife Department are primarily staffed by lawyers. Martha Williams, for example, um, that runs U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She's the director today. She came out of Montana, but she was. She wasn't the attorney general, but she she had a, a legal a high legal position out there. And then they moved over her over in Montana to run fish to, to the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And um, and then she you know, um, you know up into Washington. And her staff is primarily attorneys. There is there are a lot of biologists there. Don't get me wrong, but they're primarily attorneys. Um, and they have offices throughout in the United States as well that are regional offices. And again, for example, uh, the regional office out in Denver 
headed by headed by an attorney. Uh, Atlanta was was an attorney. She's she's now retired. I'm, I'm trying to remember who has replaced her, but she basically an attorney. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has offices throughout the country that are that are staffed by attorneys. And agriculture, of course, does, uh, but they're primarily they're field people that primarily apply to CRP and, and and other programs and reg and regulate them and and work with the, the farmers, the ranchers throughout the country. Um, so that's basically the, the window of opportunities that, that there are many out there that young lawyers have. And uh, you know, I urge you to 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 look hard at that field as you're coming out of law school. When I was here, I was bound to determine I was going to be, you know, the antitrust lawyer uh, that applied it to foreign trade and commerce, and that's where I was headed. And it just didn't work out that way. And I kind of got into this this field by accident, um, as I said earlier. Um, had I looked directly at this area. I probably would have got entry a lot quicker than you know than I did by voluntary work and service. Um, now, the, these the, the, this, and I should say, you know, you're not going to make the money working for the federal government <laughs> that you are with, with a law firm. But with the federal government, you have certain perks uh, with a lot of time off, believe it or not. And um, the like, whereas law firm, well, you're cannon fodder. You know, they choose you up 90 hour weeks. <laughs> that, they, I mean, they're tough, tough to deal with. And I know I came out of the law and worked for but they're they're ninety an hour week jobs. It just eats you up. You don't have a life. I mean, you live in their libraries and their, you know, in your offices. You know, doing the doing the legwork for the senior lawyers. But you know, you learn the business. But again, they're primarily uh, not counsel, uh, uh, consultation oriented. They're primarily litigation oriented. And uh, uh, I'm not sure what orientation, Christian, uh, Christian um, you give the students here as to. To where, where to go, what to look at. But that's just a quick overview. Do you, do you focus on primarily on, on litigation uh, and, and such that they're trained in litigators? Well, we, uh, I think we, we get all kinds. Uh, in fact, yesterday was our first class for the semester at the clinic. Um, and we asked one of the questions that we had everybody answer was kind of flippantly, what do you want to be when you grow up? And some of them want to be litigators and some of them want to work for big firms and some of them want to be quote unquote do gooders uh, on the wildlife side. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we get a, a big mix. We've always tried to take the approach that I mean, I, I admitted as I admitted yesterday and I've admitted to every class, it warms my heart uh, when I have all of our when I hear about students who go into public interest mm -hmm. environmental law, mm -hmm. because that's where my background is. But we also we also know that sometimes life happens and there's a million different reasons to make decisions and sometimes you end up at a firm and sometimes you end up doing uh defense you do defense um litigation defense mm -hmm. um, so bad guys you're doing yeah. bad guy work but um uh we also know that the kind of training that we can provide allows them to bring sensitivity to these issues regardless of where they go and we want them to have that we want them to have that perspective even if they end up going to work for big firms that are primarily doing defense um, so I, it, we, we get a we get a, a really wide range. One of the problems that we have in Indiana, I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, but I also hear students talk about it sometimes, is that there just aren't very many environmental jobs that aren't big law firms. Yeah. I mean, if you're gonna if you want to do environmental law and you want to and you and you care about Indiana because you have family here or for whatever reason, um, <clears throat> you end up you go work for Barnes and Thornburg or or Baker and, and Daniels. Mm -hmm. um, that's just because that's the only jobs that there are. I mean, the Nature Conservancy has a few jobs that are lawyers. Um, Hoosier Environmental Council doesn't. Uh, Conservation Law Center is the only public interest environmental law firm in the entire entire state. 
And we're up to five full-time lawyers now, which is more than we used to have, but still it's a pretty small number, right? Mm -hmm. So there just really aren't many opportunities. When Kim came out of law school, she went to Valparaiso University Law School. I know you have a Valparaiso University connection. I'm from Valparaiso, my own self. Mm -hmm. um, when Kim came out of law school, she wanted to be a do-gooder, public interest environmental lawyer and had to start, had to hang out her own shingle mm -hmm. because there just, there isn't opportunities there. So one of the questions I would have for you, if you have any perspective on it, is um, not so much how do we fix that dynamic, because I don't know that, that anybody of us can do that necessarily. Um, but if a young lawyer wants to go into a firm, how can they, and then, but, you know, so they're going to end up doing an environmental, they're going to do litigation defense most of the time. How can they make a positive contribution if they have it in their heart that they, yes, I know I'm going to do this for my job and I'm going to try to advise my clients and do the best job I can, but I also have my heart in the, in the public interest side. Are there ways that they can be active in that, in, on that side while they're, while they're practicing for one of the big firms? That was a long question. I'm not sure. Well, no. <laughs> well, I'm glad you touched upon or, or talked about the, the public interest sector because I didn't really address that at all. Um, there are good guys and there are bad guys in, in the public interest area. Um, the bad guys, the lead uh, is uh, CBD uh, down in uh, Tucson, uh, Center for Biological Diversity. They're the lead bad guy. And the next one is uh, Western Watersheds, which is also out in the West. It's up, I think, in Idaho, if I'm not mistaken. There are a number of them. But they're, like you, you mentioned, uh, not Pew, you mentioned one. Oh, uh, 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 oh, TNC, the uh, yeah, um, TNC. There are a number of, of the good ones out there, and uh, they're interesting firms to work with. But they, for example, over in Denver, there's the Mountain States Law Firm, and then further out in California, there's Earth Justice, which came out of which came out of Sierra Club. Um, Sierra Club. <laughs> that was the, the legal arm of Sierra Club for many years, and they were spun off. Uh, but there are a number of other firms like that. And um, <clears throat> uh, uh, I'm surprised there are not more here. You're the only public interest firm here because um, I just, I don't, have, I don't have my research material here, but I just, there, those are two that jump in my head at Earth Justice and Mountain States um, and, and Denver. Um, but there, there are a lot of others, a number of others, and, you, and there you can you can research and find out what they are. Uh, if you do go to, if you're interested in that area, I would stay away from the bad guys. I mean, they've really got a bad reputation. But more importantly, as you want to move on beyond them, you've already you've already, you've already dedicated on your resume the fact that you indicated you were there, and that will not play well as you want to broaden your career into the good guys or into different areas. But if you work for CBD, that's got a, that's got a black, I mean, that's going to put a black mark on your resume. So be real conscious of where you do what, what's going to end up on the resume. Really, it, uh, but I'm not sure I answered your question. Well, that's okay. A, a related question, touching on something else that you mentioned earlier. Um, and let's and this, Rob, maybe you know something I don't know. I don't think the law school really does try to provide the sort of human relations training that you were talking about. I don't. I, I can. I can think of aspects of different classes that touch on that kind of thing, but I don't think that's a that's a focus of any particular class or any particular kind of training. Mm -hmm. We are going to. We are in the process of. We are just beginning the process of going through a new strategic planning, and Rob Fishman and I are involved in working on the environmental on the environmental curriculum uh, for the next 10 years, presumably. Um, what sort of training could you envision that you think might be helpful? Yeah. <clears throat> I have to think about that. Um, let me respond, however, by saying that, let's see, we are 15th, uh, 15th group. About about 20 years ago, um, uh, four of us were sitting around a fire, which 
Cody, Wyoming. We just finished an all day board meeting. We were, we were tired and we were all sitting around having the brew afterwards and just relaxing because we knew we were going to have another hard day the next day. But we got to talking, uh, and uh, Steve Williams was then director of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And he said, you know, my, my, my biggest fear is the fact that uh, when you look at the demographic chart uh, of, of, of folks, um, we have got a real gap coming in our senior leadership. All of a sudden, the demographics that he was looking at uh, came along and said, they were just a fairly straight line in terms of the types of people who would be attracted to work like fish and wildlife for the Forest Service. And there was a huge dip. And he should, he, he, he got the, he had the report that had been commissioned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And all, there was a huge dip. And we then went back to that. We decided as a group, and there was there were four of us, and we all represented different interest groups within the natural resource arena. So we went, we, we went back to that term and, and brought include just a broader curriculum, a broader baseline. And we found out that dip was far worse coming with, with the senior leadership and, and the retirements. In other words, retirements were, were going along and they were going to go like this. Just at the same time, the, mm, the gap was working the other way in, in, the, in the demographics. And so we said to ourselves, so, okay, we need to start a crash course. Harvard has these crash courses in Stanford and Cody in the summertime. And we need to start a crash course uh, to take all of these biologists that Steve was talking about, professionals in that area, um, and and put them through through create a curriculum and put them through a crash course that would, would uh, boot up their management skills and their HR skills because they were scientists. So we used to look at, you know, at field data and collecting field data and so forth. And uh, they weren't people, uh, ma managers at all. So we created a, a group and uh, let's see, I just went off the board. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, let's go ahead. Uh, we, we, and so we, we teach a two week spring course out at, uh, in, at the National Conservation Training Center in, in Shepherdstown. Um, and then in the fall, we teach it to the, the, the to, then they're given a project in the summer to, to write a paper to work on. And then they, they present them in the fall and we move those around. We went to Big Cedar Lodge in, in Missouri and went to Grand Canyon and we, we go different places. For the for the fall course, and uh, and we've got about five hundred what we call fellows that have graduated from that particular uh, program. We have we try to limit it to about thirty five or forty uh, students a year. They're mid career professionals, and um, they have to be uh, recommended and nominated to to be a participant in that course. By their boss or their director of their particular group or whatever, and uh, uh, and then and then we vet them because we get like three hundred applications for each each uh, co uh, co cohort. And as I said, we are I think we're in our fifteenth or sixteenth cohort. I'm last track. We have to raise about a half million dollars a year voluntarily across the country to support that program. And we have. We have a, a interesting composition of who gives us money because the oil and gas industry, of course, gives us a little bit of money because they want us to steal uh, things their way, and we don't. We don't get all. In fact, people are teaching our our English leaders institute up in Harvard, the Harvard professors that, 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 that you know run the course, um, and. Uh, so that's how we tried to address the HR issue with the mid-level biologists that are getting pushed up because there's nobody above them, they're all retired, pushed up into jobs to, to, you know, to manage uh, uh, people and, and issues like that. Now, what do we do? What does the curriculum look like? Well, um, 
there, there are a lot of in, you know, in classroom sessions where we talk about problem issues and the like and have them solve the, you know, the particular real world issue that, that has perhaps been, been developed or come about in the past. But also, we're in the field. Uh, they have to build a, a, a rope, for example, as a team, they have to build a rope, a rope uh, uh, to walk across. And, you know, and they've got ropes on both sides of them and, and a big rope right in the middle. And there are other team exercises out, you know, out in the field that we teach them uh, uh, teamwork, how to select a leader, how to, you know, who's going to do what and so forth. That's just, I mean, that's, it's kind of a, a, a funny thing, but there are other field exercises that we put them through that teach, you know, a particular uh, element. That one is, is uh, teamwork. More like, um, but to answer your question specifically, uh, Sean Riley is the leader of this issue, this kind of this this uh, discipline up at uh, Michigan State, and um, I would I would just uh, urge you, uh, Kristen and and Rob, to to uh, ask uh, Sean Riley. I've got his email, uh, and. Um, he could advise you and send you his curriculum and, and what they do up there to deal with that very subject. Yes, Ron. I, I wonder if you could talk about another type of divide. You've, you've spoken about the importance of bridging divides between the, the word-oriented culture of lawyers and the microscopic hypothesis testing culture of scientists and the, the culture of, of, of land owners and managers. Um, can you uh, share with us um, an anecdote where you've successfully bridged political and ideological divides? So you've mentioned the Center for Biological Diversity and the Wild Sheep Foundation. Most, more often than not, opponents in 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 the legal forum. Yep. But there certainly are times where groups like that come together in coalition. That's correct. To promote a particular type of rulemaking or to promote legislation. How does that happen? What comes immediately to mind, Rob, um, and, and, and uh, students is um, the wolf, the ongoing saga of the listing, listing deep listing of the wolf. And we and it, it, it comes through a common bond. That bonding or that work coming together comes through a common bond that they both can identify with. Um, and for example, the the bad guys, the CBDs and the mm, you know, PETA, that's another group, um, have worked closely with TNC and others on on. The, the wolf issue uh, when it was time to delist the wolf, especially out west. And it, it's the occasional common bond of, of interest that both parties have in the same issue and agree on, on, the, on the, the principles of that particular issue. I'm not sure I'm answering your question in a you know, fashion that properly responds to your question. Well, I just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand more how how groups can overcome the way they label each other mm -hmm. bad guys mm -hmm. in order to achieve something that they could not achieve if yep. they were each working separately and in an adversarial yep. manner. Well, part of that comes through the HR skill that they, some of them have developed, the human relations skill, where they can look at both sides. Um, as much as I dislike CBD, for example, Conservation of the Center for Biological Diversity, and have damned in a, a book I wrote on the Equal Access to Justice Act, they nevertheless forced the federal government to better manage their listing and delisting program by putting it in, in, in separate bins of high importance to low importance, and then and then count each each pin when it was going to get hurt. Whereas before it was 
never published. It was never really properly directed. And even though many of us hold them, um, condemn them for a lot of their work, that particular issue was agreed upon by, by the entire community. The Fish and Wildlife Service, you've got to do a better job of how you're going to manage your listing programs. And as the petitions come in, for example, what forced that was um, CBD and Western watersheds, and there's a third one that's not coming to my mind. They they dumped 451 listing petitions on Fish and Wildlife Service's deck in one day. And Fish and Wildlife Service have got 90 days to determine whether or not there is a likelihood that that could be a listed species. And then they've got nine months thereafter to do the, the, the legwork. Well, if you've got 400 and some species dumped on you at once, I mean, there's no way it's going to happen in 90 days or 12 months. And so, bingo, the lawsuit hits, the, the deadline lawsuit hits. But nevertheless, when, 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 when Fish and Wildlife Service finally came to the table and finally um, recognized the, the angst, not only of CBD, but others in the community, most of the community got behind revamping how the Fish and Wildlife Service dealt with petitions. And um, in that instance, um, that, that common issue brought us, brought all of us together. Um, when, when the, when the, the petitions were filed originally. I mean, we were all armed and ready to go, go to the battlefront and fight. Uh, but the more we reflected on it, began to think about it and realized how screwed up um, and how haphazard the, the service had been in its approach to candid species, to potentially threatened species, to obviously species at high risk. Um, um, and began to force them to categorize them. Then it made a lot more sense, and from a from a practical standpoint, of administering the Endangered Species Act with a business-like approach to it. And that's just one example. Um, There was another example similar to that, and it's just not coming to me this morning. Um, yes, ma'am. Could you um, talk about, so you've, you've talked about the Center for Biological Diversity as um, quote unquote, the bad guys, and given this uh, really great example of how they did force an issue that you um, think brought, you know, see brought the two sides together. Yeah. Could you talk about why, what it is that um, CBD did to be labeled that? Like, was it an extreme position that they've taken? Could yeah, you talk yeah, about Karen that? Karen Suckling, and I forget the other guy's name, but Karen is sort of the lead mm -hmm. uh, character in that actor in that particular installation. And when they started out, they they took some pretty, pretty radical positions back in 95, 6, 7. And they would find the lowliest creature they could find in the earth or on the earth, whether it be a worm or a bug or whatever, or some, you know, some what we would consider as you know, citizen a totally useless being and, and, um, and uh, an entity, I should say, an organism of some sort. Uh, or a microorganism, and they would they would petition for a listing, and they would repeatedly do that. Which got you know, I mean, why waste the fish and wildlife service time mm -hmm. on this particular uh, species when we've got far more important things to do? Mm -hmm. And they did that repeatedly, and that's really what got them the bad guy label. But then they became fairly um, predictable. Uh, activists showing up at different places. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a white polar bear suit that, 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 that you know, one of their employees would wear. Uh, they, they did a mask, a demonstration of the Wall Street, for example, and they 
had the guy in the polar bear with a cow, I don't know what it was, uh, in a polar bear suit, you know, waving a waving a placard about a, a particular issue that they were all against. And that polar bear uh, character showed up three or three times, showed up just, oh, I know. All the employees of CBD got together because they felt they were underpaid. And they now went after their boss, Karen Suckling, and the organization. And uh, the polar bear showed up again. <laughs> Within the last month, they settled the lawsuit, or they settled it, the controversy. Uh, but they took they took CBD to court. Their own employees took them to court to get higher wages. So it seems like the, the message is <clears throat> for public interest lawyers. Yeah. Certainly, I can speak to my own uh, view and experience as a public interest lawyer in this field for many years. Um, the passion can sometimes drive you yeah. to take a very strong position on something. Um, and I think sometimes that's necessary. Um, but I think maybe what I'm hearing from you is that as a lawyer and a professional, that it's really incumbent upon us to think about how we're presenting that passion. Because maybe sometimes it can come off as too extreme too or off-putting and yeah. we're not able then to build that trust that's, with the other side right. or to build that bridge with players and stakeholders that we need to work with. Right. Um, that's a good point, and I'm glad you mentioned it, because I, want, I, I did want to talk about the the the, the person and, and, and the community itself from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. I have a passion. I mean, I really have a passion for species and for, for what I do, and, and make things happen. Um, and that passion, unfortunately, and I'm I tend, sometimes sometimes think black and white. And and I, I guess from a kid, I never learned to you know, see the middle ground where I could see both sides. And seeing both sides keeps you balanced. Um, I remember I remember here at school during our three year period, we were taught I don't know which class it was, but we were taught to prepare. Uh, uh, both sides of a particular argument and brief them and argue them. Uh, do you still use that as part of your dynamic here? Okay, good. Well, maintaining that that ability to see both sides and give the other person uh, or the other position, you know, an opportunity to be heard and really look at it for what it stands for, takes a certain bit of humanity, takes a certain bit of humility. Really, I mean, if you're just locked and loaded and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I have been too many times. And then, you know, I stumble over myself because my God, it was so obvious. The solution that the passion just didn't look the other, you know, didn't look the other way, didn't see the opportunity to work with the, with an opponent on a particular issue. And I'm glad you brought that up uh, because it, maintaining that balance is seeing both sides. And that's part of humility, which some lawyers never learn. <laughs> Some lawyers never learn that. But um, it's a small, the other thing I want to share with you is this it's a small community. I mean, we live in a very, very small community. Our, you know, the biologists, the scientists, the lawyers, the activists, and um, the professional administrators of various uh, programs and the like. We all know each other. It is a real small community. It's amazing. I've been at this 60 years come next uh, year, and uh, it's amazing. We had 130 at lunch yesterday up at uh, uh, Connor Prairie. And of that 130, I was just amazed that all the folks came up to say hello that I haven't seen for years, but we know we know each other. You know, you look at a guy's or a gal's face, you know, and just in a heartbeat, even though you may maybe have seen him or just observed, uh, sent an email back and forth for 20 years. But the minute they show up, it's, that bond is there again. And it's, it's part of a, of a common love and respect for our human resources and the need, the need to husband and manage our natural resources. Um, and I just, if, if you do consider coming into this, this world, know that you're entering a world that has got just a very small populace that you will get to know and, and respect very quickly. And, and 
So I, I sit on, on a legal committee that meets twice a year uh, that is primarily the attorney generals from the United States that sit in that room for a day and we you know we meet on natural resource issues and whatever there's the hot buttons are in the various states we hear about and we talk about how they're being managed by that particular state how they, how another state might have managed it and the like uh, but those those guys and gals in that room you know they they come and they go sometimes with their various administrations but most of them are, are lifers they're there for a long time and uh, it's 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 just it's hard for me to go to a meeting. The North American Wildlife and Natural Resources Group meets in March of every year. We've been around since 1911. Wildlife Management Institute is the one that manages that. Uh, they're one of the four uh, stakeholders in the new CRU here in Indianapolis, or in Indiana, as well as all of them, those that have been created around the country. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, those people, I mean, my God, the, 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 the last people that run that yet, am I, uh, Steve Williams, for example, before him was uh, Raleigh Sparrow. And I can just go back through the directors of that over the years who, who became good friends because you're in the trenches a lot with them, uh, testifying in Capitol Hill or badgering, you know, one of the agencies, you know, for a particular ruling or or whatever you you know the issue is as you're after but just know it's a very small community and um, it's amazing the, the the ties that you make because those bridges are part of the human dimension and uh, the guy that was here uh, uh, or gal that was at on that committee and on the hill is now sitting over here and he or she you know you, you just the, the communication with them continues and it really building those bridges by being in that community are, uh, are, are uh, fruitful, not only from a very personal and human interest standpoint, because you really get to like these people, but also from getting your business done. Uh, it's just amazing how having that sensitivity to the uh, who they are, what they do, how deep is their family? Oh, this is a you know you you know you, you just remarried. It was a guy from California uh, who I think his family is the largest lumber company in the, in, in the United States. Example, and his wife had a terrible accident a couple of years ago. And when I saw him in December, he had this gorgeous uh, uh, young older lady, but you know that he had married. And and you know you're just you spend time getting to, to know them and, 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 and so forth. His wife was, was lovely, we all miss her. But that's what I mean. There's a real human element to our world that you don't get perhaps in other fields, the high tech field, the computer field, I don't know, whatever. Um, but at any rate, and, uh, um, and through that, you, know, you begin to see both sides because you, you work on so many issues that sometimes you're over here and, Later, as life goes on, or as the pact of <clears throat> field of change, you're over here. And you, you don't burn bridges. That's the one thing you never do, and no matter how mad <laughs> you get over a particular issue or a decision somebody has made, you never really let go. You've always got to be in control and just not, and not really um, uh, let yourself become unprofessional. But because you never know where that person is going to end up. Where that person is going to, where you need that person down the road for 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 something, you know, on a particular issue, and boy, burning bridges is I I, I came close once to doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I did because he ended up being a judge that I had to <laughs> later on, you know. But I really wanted to tell him once where to go. Uh, <laughs> About this news, uh, we can keep asking. I'm sure that those of us who think about this stuff all day, every day, can keep asking questions. Uh, it, do any of you have any questions you'd like to offer? I'm sure there are questions out here. Must be. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so you talked a lot about how. I'm sorry. You spoke a lot about how, in your experience, you would go to the different states, and you're most successful when you didn't present yourself as someone from the feds trying to 
take control of the operation, but try and work with them where they were. And I'm thinking today, since we, it seems like every other week there's a new federal regulation being rolled back or the power of the federal government to control or regulate these things being stripped away. But we're also at a time where the states, especially rural states, are very hostile to regulatory states and they see it as tyranny of the experts. In your experience working with these states and not like imposing yourself as like a member of the federal government trying to take control from them, how can we get them to be more accepting? Because now the burden is all on them. The states are the ones that have to control this and take responsibility. Is there a way to reach out to them that doesn't seem so? Only through building trust. A good question. But it takes building trust. It may take, you know, five meetings sitting at the kitchen table having a cup of coffee or whatever, but you don't go in and start immediately on whatever it is on your mind. You find out what they're, how, how can you help them by asking the question, what can I do, you know, in, in, a, in a tangential way, what problems and issues are you facing? What are you struggling with? Um, he may have lost five calves last year to the wolves or the or grizzly bears, for example. And you, you, you explore with them their problems, ask them about their life and their families and their careers. But more importantly, how, how's, what's it like to run this farm or ranch in order to manage this timber uh, reserve that you have here? Um, and, and visit with them about the issue and focus on the issue and, and the like, rather than making it really personal uh, from the standpoint of how can I help you, boom, right out of the box. You, you explore with them what their issues are first, and that takes trust for them to even come out because this, this you see this, when you see that, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it's tough to get me on that. I remember I was, we were working on a project up in uh, North Dakota. Now, I don't want to pick on the, the West <laughs> moving, you know, beyond the 100th parallel of 98 today, I guess, they're moving. But um, the Westerners, I just, I just, you know, I've got a book, the, 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 the manuscript is due of September 30th. And my editor said, you know, one of the things you need to do is explain to the reader um, why Westerners are so resistant to change, to the invasion of the federal government into their lives, whether they like it or not. Uh, because the feds get into your hair cradle to bring it to a uh, grave. I mean, whether it's health care, uh, abortion, sewage, uh, waste waste management, whatever. The feds are there with the rig. And um, so I had to write this in this particular chapter about the Western and why they're so difficult because they are, you know, tough. I remember I was having this uh, meeting, a town meeting I held in, uh, in North Dakota. And we were we were trying to acquire a 24,500 acre ranch. It was the last piece of Theodore Roosevelt's original Elkman ranch. It was in private hands, but the people that owned it for forever didn't want it to go be cut up into ranchettes, you know, TR ranchettes, you know, live where TR once lived in Rome. And they're like, okay. So we held this, and North Dakotans are tough. And man, I walked into that room and everybody had their cowboy hat <laughs> and they were like this. And they didn't say a word. And we got to this point in, in, in visiting and, and explaining to them why we were, we were doing this and uh, why we wanted to acquire it. And uh, until the bad guy left, he, I didn't realize he was sitting near the back, but there was, like, there was the chairman of the, of the county commission sitting back there. And when he left, then the hands came down, mm -hmm. and they, they knew he would because he was he was a son of a. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, sorry, I should have silenced it. I came in here, um, uh, but at any rate, um, and he was a really bad guy. I mean, he was. <laughs> a bad guy. Matter of fact, he told me face to face 
when I was out there on that particular visit. No, no, don't ever come back to this town because you go out, you know, in a box. I mean, he told me that fish to fish. That's kind of what kind of character it was. And uh, they, they loosened up one. And um, <clears throat> oh, Westerners, okay. <laughs> Westerners are tougher than Easterners. Easterners uh, populated the East more quickly. They lived closer together. They got to know, they're forced to know each other and deal with each other on all levels. Uh, you get you get out in the West. Um, you get out in the West and uh, they've still got that mentality of the next neighbor is, a, you know, a mile or two away this way. And the ranches are huge and the like. Other than the cities, that the rural population out there in the West uh, have, have a lot of history of, of individual rugged, uh, the rugged individualism of their of their um, existence, um, that cowboy myth of, um, of uh, um, that they still carry with them uh, with Word Rogers and uh, Clint Eastwood and and uh, Gary. Uh, was it um, John Wayne, you know, in the Westerners? That mythic West was created through Hollywood, still runs in their veins because a lot of them, you know, even they're younger today and they're only third or fourth or fifth generation, they still had that mentality in their head that Grandpa had when he brought, you know, when he came out here in a covered wagon and he came, you know, and he sustained himself. They had to build their own the structures to live in and, and maintain their animals and so forth. <clears throat> And there are certain pieces of their personality that are very distinct because, because of the, the, the historical context within which they were raised. And you've got to identify. You got you just got to get to know that and understand that in order to, to better negotiate with them and, and explore with them what their problems are. Uh, I'm not sure have I answered your question. In a roundabout way, I've learned a lot. <laughs> okay, well, um, and they're tough, they're tough animals, but at any rate, you just got to know that. You got to understand that when you're dealing with them, that the, the guy from uh, or the Alpha Bangor, Maine is going to be operating differently, responding differently than the rancher from Utah and the like. Uh, back in the 30s, a lot of the Westerners lost their ranches in tax sales. Um, and they either stayed there and then leased the land back after it was taken by the federal government because the counties didn't, the counties couldn't, couldn't handle it. And so they let the federal government take over. And a lot of those ranchers then, their ancestors continued to lease that ground for cows or whatever. And they still think they own that land, even though the federal government owns it. And they resent it, highly resent it. And there's a seed of that resentment that was born way back, you know, way back when. And so when you approach somebody, you got to begin to find out about their past, where they're from, where they, well, what's the context of their existence, and what issues do they face, you know, in their daily lives, and the like. Um, let me think. Oh, um, this is an article that I wrote. Um, I gave a, a, a lecture here once uh, when we installed the Jerome Hall bus in the um, in the library and named the library after Jerry Hall, Dr. Doctor. Um, he was a great, great he was a great intellectual thinker, and um, I uh, uh, the day we did that, Lauren Rebel was. The dean at the time, and she asked me to <clears throat> speak with the with the dedication group that all came together in the in the courtroom. And afterwards, the editor of the law review came up, and I had it written. And he said, uh, "I'd like to run that, you know, in the law review." <clears throat> so I said, "Well, let me clean it up. This is prepared for oral delivery versus you know the reader." And <clears throat> so I rewrote it, and it's called. Uh, Dr. Jerome Hall uh, calling a North Star in my life. And I, when I started getting hits on the dashboard, there's a dashboard that keeps track of 
you know, how many times it's been downloaded. And the first 10 or 15 times, oh, people, God, people are reading my, you know, what I'm reading, reading about me. Well, it's not about me, it's about Dr. Hall. And that's how they picked it up on Google is, you know, when they know one about Dr. Hall. I think we're up to 175 unique hits on that particular article. But that article, the reason I mention you is because in that article, and I meant to scan up one of the poems on the airplane come down, because this was published back in uh, 2006, uh, are all the things I learned about how to negotiate through my career from Dr. Hall, what he taught me. I learned more from working for that man for two years than I did sitting in any classroom. And I would urge you to, to, to read that, um, not because I wrote it, but because the ideas that were expressed about how to manage your career and what are the high points, what were the, really the high points that I learned from this genius, because he was a genius. And um, I could go on and on about Dr. Paul, he was, he was great. I miss him terribly. One of the things that I didn't do, and I commend you to do this, is if is to once I got into my, my career, come back and visit with him. Um, he was forced to retire when he was 65. I don't know whether, whether the law school or the state still insist upon that. But he was forced to leave here when he was 65. But God, he was at the zenith of his career. His mind was very, very good. And he ended, he went to Hastings out in uh, the West Coast. Hastings Law School. And uh, I, I, even though I'd occasionally go to the West Coast, I didn't go to keep up with him. It's important that you as students attach yourself to a mentor here, whether it be Rob or Kristen or whatever professor it is here in Kim that you, you, you really can relate to and learn from them and watch them about their, how they you know, how they conduct their careers and the like. And you'll learn a lot, but you not only do you develop a friendship, but you do, you, 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 you learn and, and pick up on a, on a, a long-term contract, contact that you can uh, turn to, uh, to say, uh, Professor, I've got a problem. You remember me? I graduated mm -hmm. such a year and I was in your class and like, and I'm, I'm struggling with an issue and you, I think you could help me ask but boy, I would sure recommend that you pick up on a mentor. Um, and I've got three mentors in my life that I follow. Uh, and uh, one of them I never met, actually. Well, he, he was he'd be the fourth mentor, but that was Winston Churchill. I learned a lot before, uh, you know, World War, just before World War II with somebody. And uh, Churchill, one of the things is never quit, never quit, never quit. You know, well, that's, I've lived my life with that. But but there are other things that are in that article that I, I commend you to read because it really will, 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 will give you a lot of guidance about how to relate to your professors here and your future you know, bosses or whomever you, you, know, you, you affiliate with because they've, they've been there, they've done it and they've, you know, and they've, they've got the, the, that human intelligence that you only develop through going to you know, taking your hits throughout your career and, and learning what it's all about because I thought it was straight up and, <laughs> you know, and it's like this. But anyway, are there any other questions that we have? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we were talking a bit about some of the ups and downs in your career. Um, and I'm just thinking about kind of in the environmental field, how it can be a little bit challenging and kind of feel hopeless at times given these big issues that we're working on, like species extinction and climate change. Um, Kind of throughout your very impressive and extensive career, do you have any examples of progress that you did see? Um, and do you have any advice for us um, going into that career about ways to stay hopeful um, and to stay driven? Well, it's um, a good question because life is kind of like a, a, a cloudless sky, all blue, that you think is out there as you step out that door with a degree. But all of a sudden, the clouds start coming through. But there's always a sunny side. And it's a matter of patience and humility. Take those hits. You know you're going to get them. And some of them can be pretty severe. And, and 
all you can do is I have great faith in the Lord. And, um, so I, you know, I spend time meditating and praying in the morning. Um, uh, I didn't do it this morning because I got up late. <laughs> but, um, but, but at any rate, uh, uh, accept that it's going to happen. Just know it's going to happen, even though everything is rosy. And, and know that there's a sunny side that you have to live through it. And uh, know that, you know, and, but you just keep going. You don't, you know, you don't change your stride. And, and it, it, I'm unfortunate. I don't reflect enough, I'm told, on the things that I've achieved. That is, you know, I just, I hit the mountaintop and I look to the next mountaintop and don't, don't take time to smell the roses. But, you know, I have a young partner He's 20 years younger than I am. And I said to him, man, you go on a lot of vacations. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> I'm, unfortunate. I'm a 24-7 guy. I work seven days a week, generally. I, I do take it up here and there. But um, spend some more time with family and well uh, uh, than thinking that uh, you got to work every day. Um, that those buttons in there because that helps then you reflect better on your next day, your next calendar. Other questions? Um, there we go. Oh, there's John. I guess I'm curious um, in your career what you found the one of the major ideological. Um, convergence points is in conservation work. Um, what sort of things bring together people from across either side of the uh, political spectrum here in the country, um, outside of the obvious, just caring about the environment? What sort of things have you found or noticed can bring people together in that way? A mutual, a mutual passion that you both have for the very issue that you're, you're, you're dealing with. Um, it's not a nine to five job being in this business. And um, if you're there dealing with something and the like, you've got a lot of brothers and sisters around you that may have different viewpoints. Um, but it's, it's paying attention to that issue. And not just treating it as just another day at the office. It's treating that issue for what it is. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. You want to try to restate that? Yeah, I think there's, especially um, contemporarily, there is a lot of, um, I feel like the media tends to push the care about the environment or, um, for example, endangered species into uh, a more liberal camp, which then causes, um, I feel like, a divergence of people who might have similar um, passions for conservation. So I didn't know if you have encountered um, certain things in your career that may not be apparent to young lawyers or young people interested in the conservation field that they immediately would have in common with people who yep. they might not find yep. those same other. Uh, the media is very distorting and it's very troublesome. And especially with the proliferation of, of fake news and so forth. And the media does have a bias, certainly with endangered species. That's my current hot dog right now is endangered species. And I haven't mentioned the big word biodiversity because mm -hmm. I've been all over that on this in the last few years. But You've got to, you've got to, um, as you're interfacing with people, understand where the media has overstated something or taken a far out position and be knowledgeable enough about a particular issue to keep everybody focused on that issue. Um, and uh, maintain the discipline of, of staying focused rather than being scattered around, which the media will do for you, as well as perhaps the person next to you or across the table that's got a higher temperature than you do on that particular passion 
you know, and they're going to they're going to insist on their particular position. Uh, there's a there's an attorney general. She's out in I think Nebraska or Iowa. God damn, every time she shows up, <laughs> I know we've got a problem because she's always on a hot button about something. And generally, she's far out in the you know, left field. But we bring her back, and we know that going in, and so we 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 you know bring her bring her bring her down out of the trees and explain to her you know there's a different approach to the issue than you you know you're recommending to your governor or your state for example I just one example but you've got to know the issue and stay focused and not get scattered just like the media will scatter you today it just the media is a blessing and a curse both. I come with them, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's something else. Um, but you've got to work with, because everybody, as you go to the Hill, everybody's got a nanosecond attention. People don't give things attention. They want to live with sound bites throughout their life and, and manage their, their issues on, uh, on a sound bite basis. And you can't do that. Some of these issues are pretty deep and, and, and take more than five seconds to really deal with them. and um stay focused that's the biggest thing stay focused and stay focused on the person that you're dealing by giving them air letting them talk you know let them talk and run down red versus interrupting I, I have a, a young associate that i had he's out of georgetown law school 15 years ago smart guy and it took him, took me five years for him to stop interrupting me and mm -hmm. others because he wanted to show his smarts. He was, he was, he was a really good kid, very good, good young man, I should say. Um, but he, you know, he, he, he has this, this insatiable desire to explain to a person how, how much more they know about that subject than he, than, than he does than they do. And, and I, I, you know, I finally trained him. <laughs> Let them talk. Focus on the person. You know, look them in the eye and listen to them as to what they've got to say. The Indians do that. I spent a lot of time around the Native Americans. And the Indians do that. If you if you spend any time with the Indians, you'll find out that they sit and listen. They sit and listen until somebody's finished talking. Then they talk. But they let them, they give enough space and air around that person to speak. And uh, they're a great example. Other questions? Maybe have time for one more? Here it is. is it no, my talking is not right. It's if someone else has one. Um, <laughs> uh, any other question? Go ahead, Lincoln. Oh, do you have a favorite endangered species? Do <laughs> <laughs> you have a favorite endangered species? The black footed parrot. Uh, they're cute little so Christmas. <laughs> they really are. Uh, and the monarch butterfly, which is not listed, but it's coming. Uh, Just like you, cute but fierce. <laughs> Good. That's a great that's a great place to wrap up. I know that Lowell has a uh, lunch appointment with the dean. Um, I want to thank you for your time and insights. I think everybody enjoyed it, and uh, we'll have a lot to talk about. I think as a, as a group, um, as a debrief, we'll talk about, we'll spend some time um, in the coming seminar, and maybe the ELS could uh, schedule something for us to talk about this. I'd be happy to come. I think Rob, Rob, Rob and Kim would both be happy to come. We appreciate your time, Will. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I really wanted to talk to this group because you, you're, you all are taking a look. You know, you've opened a window. For however long you're with this uh, particular class, or what? How many credits do they get? Three credits per semester. Most students take it for two semesters in a row. Okay. Well, since since you've expressed an interest in natural resources and wildlife conservation, this is the group I really wanted to focus because the biggest problem we have today. And I'm going to take a minute to just talk. Yeah, uh, I just feel so dedicated to. So far, so long. So long. That's the fact, real fact. But it's the biodiversity crisis that we are facing in America. Most people don't know it, and they don't want to hear about it, especially the energy industries. But the 
by, by diversity, first of all, is just is by definition, it's all living plants, animals, and organs. Whatever, whatever is living, it's it's part of the biodiversity community. Endangered species is one of the gate, but one of the, the, the it's the triad that plus climate change. Climate change is affecting endangered species, which is in turn um, bringing the, the the pool of species that support each other down slowly and man is right in the middle and man's future food and drug supply just as two examples are at serious risk serious risk of um, of uh, well they're, they're at serious risk period creating potential national crisis 50 percent of all of our drugs are derived from plants and animals and of that Many of those are endangered species. As the habitat of those species erodes through floods, hurricanes, other natural disasters, uh, forest fire, wild forest fires, uh, and uh, and heat. Um, I mean, uh, I was talking to my surrogate grandson about the pika. Uh, the pika lives in my habitat. Explaining as it got hotter, you know, he didn't have any, they don't have any place to go. He said, You mean the pike is going to be toast? <laughs> and I said, Yes, Sammy, it's going to be toast one day, as humans may be in a, in, you know, in a thousand years. Until, because we're all assuming that through technology and human and engineering, we will have, we will fix things so the human uh, doesn't. Uh, lose his you know doesn't lose his place as he is today in his comforts uh, he'll always or he or she will always have a, a warmer cool climate house to live in and you know and a job and food to eat and drugs to take and so forth but as that gets slowly diminished it's like a, a balloon that the air is slowly going out and with and the Endangered Species Act, we call it the emergency room. Yeah. As those species become highly endangered, um, they, you know, they become either at, threatened or at risk and, are, and get listed and dealt with. And um, I, I have two books. One was supposed to be out to volume one, uh, the last 50, the first 50 years of BSA history was supposed to be out. 15th of this month, and they just, I wonder where's my copy? <laughs> And uh, that's supposed to be out to now, uh, September 5th, and then November, uh, and then in November, volume two comes out. So volume one is the last 50 year history, volume two is the next 50 years. And it's got smart people that understand what the future holds, writing, you know, writing in that particular book as a guide for legislators, policymakers, the general public. Um, but it is going to be the future guide. Rob is one of our authors. I went out to uh, several, a number of smart, really smart people that I that I know, like Rob. Uh, and there, one, there's two other lawyers that wrote chapters, but the rest are all PhD scientists that work with with uh, endangered species, and they they put their contributions in. That'll be out in November. But the publisher, in frustration, called me up. On February or March, and he said, "You know, well, he said I, I took your management. Man, they're both already at the printing presses." He said, "I took a moment, finally read them. I read your executive summary, and so but I read your books." Uh, and uh, I said, "Well, John, I hope you had a good bottle of whiskey <laughs> to read them." With. He said, heavy. And he said, "Well, they're heavy. They're dense. They're very complete. They're very thorough." But he said, "You really got to like this subject, and we're going to have to." This price on it is expensive. Um, I want you to write a third on the Endangered Species Act. Now, if you've ever tried to get anything published, you know how hard it is to find a publisher. I mean, it's real hard. And and I've been I've been blessed by having a publisher stand by me. He said, I want you to write another book, which is due September 30th, the manuscript. And and he said, I'm going to sign an editor to you to teach you, a lawyer, how to write. <laughs> for the lame. So I'm uh, I'm finished with five chapters. I've got four more to go. And we're writing a book 
for the land. Mm -hmm. And we're being able to put into it uh, things that I couldn't put in the other books that didn't really relate that are of human interest. Mm -hmm. And my God, I've got love affairs in there, murder, <laughs> no, murder suicide, uh, pretty uh, fist fights that have occurred throughout that 50 years over the endangered species animal. And it, uh, frankly, I'm getting entertained. <laughs> <laughs> and learning a different style to write. But uh, that's coming out, that'll come out now on Earth Day next year, April 22nd. So um, I urge the librarian here to, well, she'll, I'll just send her a copy of each, <laughs> volume one and two. And uh, uh, then volume three, you'll be able to buy, a, you know, the bookstore, it'd be 250,000 words or about, it's, it's about, it's a small book. It's a standard size bookstore, but that's coming out. But um, pay attention to the biodiversity issue and its relationship. Few people, I was amazed at the scientists that I know, when I started connecting biodiversity with the Endangered Species Act and with climate change and how one affects the other, they're all part, part and parcel of the same. How few scientists said, oh, no, they really don't, really don't. Well, I finally started one of my favorite scientists who is also, a, he's an editor of, of volume two, finally came around and said, you know, I finally understand what you can say. And uh, so that's the theme, though, is how those three tie together. And what we as an individual in America can do to address it and so forth. So that's my uh, five minute blurb on appreciate it. Uh, um, the endangered species. Mm -hmm. I have so many books. <laughs> <laughs>